Hi, my name is Ruth Andrade, and I am the strategy lead for our Earthcare team here at Lush. And I've been working with Lush since 2004. I actually started as a sales assistant in one of our um, top retail stores in the world, in Covent Garden. And because I was uh, already trying to implement environmental practices in the shop, I was invited to support the business. And I was actually the first environment officer uh, that Lush ever had in 2005. And since then, I've been working the business, also leaving to set up a couple of uh, nonprofit projects, coming back. And now I've been back for four years and leading, yeah, leading the work in our climate and nature plan. So at Lush, we've been uh, considering the environment since Lush was founded in 1995. And then in 2004, 2005, we really started uh, accelerating um, the positive benefits that we wanted to bring to the cosmetic industry. So we had already, for example, invented naked products that didn't need any packaging. We then also started bringing um, recycled content to the packaging that we did have. And then over the years, we were just implementing more and more measures, like, for example, renewable and electricity. And um, in 2014, we rebranded the team from Green Team into Earthcare because we really want to... Um, having the name of the team, who our main stakeholder is, that we're doing this as a strategy to care for the earth. And then under this large circle of people that are often working in different departments, we come together as the earth care to have a look at how we can leave the world lusher than we found it. So what can we do within our operations, um, especially our operations, to be more and more driving forward the cosmetics industry, but also actively reducing our impact and making sure we're engaging all staff to come on this journey with us. As the Earthcare team, together with many other teams within Lush, we have been rethinking our environmental strategy. And we have just recently launched our new climate and nature strategy that we call the to-do list for climate and nature, because we don't want this to be commitment based on long-term targets. We want this to be a very action-focused to-do list on what can be done now because we have no time to lose. Like the, the climate and the ecological emergency are emergencies. You know, we have this urgency. We cannot have a commitment that means net zero by 2050 or even 2030. Uh, we are really interested in how can everyone in the business do what needs to be done right now, and therefore the to-do list for climate and nature. So at Lush, we were rethinking our environmental strategy, and we decided to call it the to-do list for climate and nature. And it's called a to-do list because it's based on real action that we can do now, rather than this long commitments for 2040 or 2050 or even 2030. Um, we definitely don't have that time. So we need to focus on what can be done now. And we looked at what are the things where we can have most impact. Um, and there are five main like big actions that we have identified. So number one is protect forests and protect wildlife. And this is basically how can we use our supply chain to make sure there is no deforestation, but more than that, to make sure that we're supporting communities that are in regions rich in biodiversity and that are big um, stores of carbon. So number two is 100% renewable power everywhere. And there's basically three things that, that we have in our strategy around that. One is powering down, using less, and this is the easiest thing to do and where ev everyone should be doing this. Number two, replacing fossil gas. And this is basically um, replacing any, anywhere where we're using gas towards electricity. So for example, space heating or process heating in our factories. And the third one is powering up with renewables. And that is within 100% renewable power. Um, then we want to make all of our materials regenerative and circular. And of course, this is gonna take some time, but we've been for the last 13 years working on regenerative uh, agriculture in our supply chain. 
and working on a circular model even longer. And this means looking at both our raw materials, how can they come from better agricultural practices, and also looking at mainly our packaging. How can we make sure that we are using as much recycled content as possible? For example, currently we have 90% recycled paper fiber in our um, supply chain. And how can we make sure that all of our packaging can be reused or reclaimed, recycled or returned to us? Number four, it's about transport. So it means radically reducing our transport emissions. And here we're saying radically reduce rather than completely go to zero because we know how hard it is it's going to be to green logistics and green all of our freight, for example. And to do that, we are both looking at how we are moving products, moving goods, moving raw materials around the world, but also partnering with early adopters of technology or people doing really interesting things like good shipping who are um, investing in sustainable shipping fuel. So yeah, that is one that we know is going to be challenging and it's going to take a few years to get that, um, that tick. Tick. <laughs> it's going to take a few years to get that completed. And the last part is stand up for climate justice and adaptation. And this is really important because the people that have been mostly affected by climate change and by extreme weather events so far are the people least responsible for causing this. So how do we stand in solidarity with communities, with land defenders, with activists, with the people that are trying to make sure that this transition is a just transition? Um, and adaptation, because we know that a lot of the, the effect, effects of the climate emergency are already out there. We are already at 1.2 degrees of warming. So we are already seeing uh, droughts and floods and various other, other types of uh, impacts for climate change. So how do we already figure out how we're going to adapt? This is the age of adaptation. How do we work with our suppliers, with our shops, with our staff, with our manufacturing uh, sites in order to also adapt to the next decades? That's it, and we cannot do this alone. We really need everyone to join us in our to-do list for climate and nature. So not only should the cosmetics industry be doing everything that we can to eliminate deforestation from the supply chain, but we can actually invest in protection, reforestation, and regenerative agriculture. And, and this is really important because often we don't compete for food crops. So uh, especially, for example, aromatics like herbs, like geranium, like jasmine, like patchouli, uh, they can be grown in conjunction with food uh, sovereignty or crops that are good for subsistence. Um, and that's a, a really interesting aspect of uh, the cosmetics industry. Same thing for uh, forest uh, materials that rely on like a standing forest. Uh, a lot of those materials are no good for food, but they can be amazing to, to be used as cosmetics, like, for example, kakui oil that we used in a soap recently, or booty tea oil from the Amazon, or tonka beans that we use as fragrance in our sleepy range. All of those materials are excellent for cosmetics, and they are really supporting communities that are safeguarding and that are looking after uh, their environment. So I'd say this is one of the most important things for the cosmetics industry, to do right now is not just to see where can we reduce our impact, but where can we have a really positive impact in protecting the planet right now.